Support for today's episode comes from Honeylove. For a limited time only, you can get Honeylove on sale. Get 20% off your entire order with our exclusive link, honeylove.com slash weirdest. Support our show and check them out at honeylove.com forward slash weirdest. I always grab my Honeylove bras when I'm looking to be as comfortable as possible. Honeylove's best-selling crossover bra gives all of the support of a traditional bra without any uncomfortable underwires. Honeylove is not just supporting women, it's empowering women. Treat yourself to the best bras on the market and save 20% off at honeylove.com slash weirdest. Use our exclusive link to get 20% off honeylove.com slash weirdest to find your perfect fit. After you purchase, they ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. Honeys, you deserve this. Free the pain and discomfort. Keep the support with Honeylove. If one of your goals is to learn a new language, you should absolutely get Babbel to help you out. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by more than 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. I've been using Babbel to try to brush up on my German skills. It's super convenient courses. Make it easy for for me to jump in whenever I have a few minutes to spare. Here's a special limited time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com slash weirdest. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash weirdest. Spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash weirdest. Rules and restrictions may apply. This episode is proudly brought to you by the award-winning hair care line, Lola V. For a limited time, you get an exclusive 15% off your entire order at lolavie.com. Just use code WEIRDEST at checkout. I've been trying out the whole Lola V line this week, and I really enjoy it. My favorite is probably the Glossing Detangler. Unlock Jennifer Aniston-approved hair at lolavie.com. As our loyal listeners, you'll get an exclusive 15% off your entire order when you use code WEIRDEST at checkout. That's 15% off your order at L O. L-A-V-I-E dot com with promo code WEIRDEST. Please note you can only use one promo code per order and discounts can't be combined. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. Your hair will thank you. At Popular Science, we report and write dozens of science and tech stories every week. And while most of the stuff we stumble across makes it into our articles, we also find plenty of weird facts that we just keep around the office. So we figured, why not share those with you? Welcome to The Weirdest Thing I Learned This Week from the editors of Popular Science. I'm Rachel Feltman. I'm Jess Bodie. I'm Owen Ever. Woo! Welcome! Owen, welcome to the show! <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> it's so great to have you. Um... Listeners, Owen is one of the hosts of a new podcast that I really think that fans of The Weirdest Thing and of my book are going to like. Mm -hmm. uh, so why don't you tell folks a little bit about it? Yeah, there's definite crossover. And <laughs> I feel so honored to be entering into the esteemed uh, cadre <laughs> of podcast hosts. This is my... Uh, my sort of my debut into the podcasting arena. So thank Welcome. you so much for welcoming <laughs> me. So hospitable, so generous. So yes, I'm working on a podcast called A Field Guide to Gay Animals with Canada Land uh, from Double Double Productions with a wonderful co-host, Lane Kaplan-Levinson, uh, who does a lot of radio journalism. And we will be exploring, investigating, celebrating queerness in the natural world. Uh, we'll be using a principal text called Biological Exuberance, Animal Homosexuality and Natural Diversity to guide uh -huh. us through. Uh, are you familiar with this book? Is it a bedside, yes, bedside yes. table <laughs> read? Yeah, for you? In, in fact, I think it's literally in a pile of books uh, my my ever growing TBR. <laughs> yes, um, yes, your emotional yes, support I, pile I of am, books. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. There must be many of them at, at any given time. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, for listeners who are curious about this book, but maybe like don't want to read it because it's seven hundred and fifty pages long. <laughs> oh my boy, God. have I got it's a fair. podcast for you? <laughs> so yeah, uh, the the podcast will be. Uh, Lane and I sort of exploring our journey with coming to understand that queerness is an inherent part of nature, as well as talking to other experts and curious folk such as yourselves who have been asking those questions and finding those affirmations. Amazing. When does it premiere? Field Guide premieres uh, mid-June, June 13th specifically, and uh, you'll be able to find it 
on Sing Along, if you know this one, Apple, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. <laughs> anywhere you get your podcasts. <laughs> yeah, we um. have the great honor of being an official selection of the Tribeca Festival. So oh, that's we'll be so launching cool. that's huge. in New York in June. Yeah, yeah. Well, then let's get into it. On the weirdest thing I learned this week, we start by each offering up a little tease about some kind of fact or story we found in the course of reading, writing, reporting, etc., and decide which one we just absolutely have to hear more about first. Then once we've all had time to spin our little science yarns, we reconvene and decide what the weirdest thing we learned this week actually was, but not in a competitive way anymore. In fact, now we don't even like decide what the weirdest thing we learned this week actually was we just assume all the things are weird yeah. and they, uh, they all are so yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we appreciate true. weirdness equally yeah yes. exactly yeah, yeah we pause reflect and <laughs> then then we stop the podcast <laughs> yes um, <laughs> because we so, must you know yes, yes. <laughs> yeah it's true uh, unfortunately yes um jess what's your tease okay i'm gonna talk about the most dramatic snake ever. Mm. <laughs> mm. It's a high bar. It, mm, it truly, okay. there are some dramatic snakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about uh, Robin Hood, the one with foxes. Oh, oh I my have, God. Yeah. Since yeah. being a child, I've always wanted to slurp a ring off of uh, King's fingers. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. that, so. I, I think that movie gave a lot of a lot of us a lot of confusing yes! feelings. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And then I went on to make a gay animal podcast. <laughs> it's all coming Is this together. My villain origin story. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. I when I hear dramatic sneaks, I think of that um I forget his name now, but there was a viral snake back when the internet was good mm. and he was a really large like ball python and he would open the door by himself and then Julius Julius yes thank you <laughs> he, he would Say like his name and he would go <laughs> he was such a derpy snake yeah uh, uh, long live Julius long in our live hearts Julius. Um, yes my tease uh, is that I'm gonna talk about uh I'm sorry. This bird is the Japanese tit, and I'm really <laughs> torn about whether to say no more. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> anyway, uh, so just you know, fill in the blank with whatever joke you would make. Uh, but I'm going to talk about some birds that wave at each other, and uh, it's very cute and polite. Okay. Um, wow. Yeah. Yes. Um, Owen, what's your tease? Okay, so m my tease is. We're going to celebrate the surprisingly horny outcome of ritualistic jousting in the animal queendom. Oh my god. Oh. I cannot oh. wait. Very exciting. On guard. I have On a guard policy indeed. Of never making guests go first, but that is tempting. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> Jess, why don't you get us started with snakes? I would love to. Now I'm thinking about the Robin Hood. Fox. So let's think about let's 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 get our minds off of this. Um, <laughs> Apolo okay. Apologies for derailing. <laughs> no, never apologize for that. Yes, that, yes, that's actually never. what we do here. Yes, <laughs> curiosities um, abound. Yeah. So okay, I was looking for a fun fact this week, and I was you know nothing nothing was really tickling my fancy, and then I found this study, and it's about a snake called the dice snake, like D I C E dice. Um, it's this non-venomous, semi-aquatic, you know, a very inoffensive snake. Looks like anything else. Uh, and it is a water snake for my fellow herp enthusiasts, if you know, you know. <laughs> um, and they're like two to four feet long. Very unassuming looking, like a regular snake. Mm -hmm. um, but they are so dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is like the biggest thing about them is that they're so, there's very drama, which I can understand because I love drama. Yes. Um <laughs> But uh, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is they have the most elaborate fake deaths in the animal kingdom, in my opinion. And that's saying a lot because there are a lot of elaborate fake deaths. Like, obviously, there's the possum um, and stuff like that. And there's even like, the, I think it's the eastern hognose snake that will like die, fake die and like writhe around and stuff like that. <laughs> um, but this one's even more dramatic and you know most most snakes do not do this uh and I, I think animals in general learn to just like run from predators most most animals will just flee uh but but here's what these dice snakes do so 
When threatened by a predator, usually from the skies, it's usually like an avian bird predator, they will do the thing that the hognose snake does, which is they like writhe around theatrically as if they're in pain. Like, you know, on the on the ground, they're kind of like rolling over and being like, ah, like, I, this hurts so bad, whatever. Uh, and then they soil themselves oh. <laughs> in both poop and this something called musk, uh, which is this foul smelling greasy milky fluid which gross um, <laughs> put and... that in a perfume and you've <laughs> got a money maker honestly True. <laughs> yeah i mean isn't isn't there a we- a gross like whale thing they yeah, put in ambergris. yeah ambergris yeah whale vomit yeah and like like beaver like anal gland secretions you know vanilla yeah we've had that that was one of the first facts on this show actually Back in the day, yeah, wasn't it? Talking wasn't about that... putting it in uh, in whiskey, I think. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, so but anyway, yes. back to the melodrama. Anyway, back to, <laughs> yes, exactly. So, um, so snakes will like release the poop and musk combo, and uh, which I think it's funny. A lot of the coverage of this study, maybe this is like a scientific thing, but they call this poop musk combo a cocktail. <laughs> That's a choice. Um, so anyway, yeah, they like will writhe in pain, excrete the cocktail, and the cherry on top is that sometimes they will cough up blood. <laughs> That's when the, the the theater director is like, "You've gone too far." Like yes. I loved the impulse with the like pooping yourself that felt really embodied. But <laughs> we're gonna to lose the, the audience when you start puking blood. Yes, precisely. Um, and sometimes it'll just like bubble up from their mouths. Like they writhe around, they poop themselves and then they go motionless and they bubble up blood from their mouth. It's so funny and dramatic. Um, so yeah, just a true master of the acting craft, I would say. Mm, Um, yeah. So why do they do this? Why do animals play dead? Basically it's because, you know, they're trying to tell the predator, I'm so dead and so gross right now. Like you don't even know, like if you eat me, you will get sick and die. Like that's, that's (laughs) their angle. Uh, and a lot of times it does work. Like it, mm-hmm. it does work for these snakes. Um, so uh, how, do, how do we know that these snakes do this? Well, somebody went out and studied it. So there's this pair of scientists from the University of Belgrade, which is in Serbia. And they went to this lake on an island. Uh, the island is called Golemgrad, which is in North Macedonia. And I... I just like the name of the island. It sounds yeah. like straight out of a video Giving game or Lord like Lord of the Rings. Yeah, that's what yeah. I think. That's what I was gonna say. It sounds like a fantasy novel. There's something. Yeah, yeah. Um, of course so, they have dramatic snakes there. Of course, of course they do. Well, get this. Apparently, it's also called uh, Snake Island. People there call it Snake Island because of all the snakes that are there. Um, cause I was like, at first I was like Golem Grad. Like I gotta go visit. And then then I learned people call it Snake Island. And I was like, wait. Do I want to visit? <laughs> but I? then I also learned people also call it Pelican Island because <laughs> it has so many pelicans. So like, you know, there's there's we're some so over, confusing it's branding so going on. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I'll go. You know, for some snakes and pelicans. Um, and also it's just a little a neat little place. It's like super small, so it's only like twenty hectares, which is less than a square mile. Um, I did math. So 50, it's 50 acres or 37 football Mm. fields. So it's little. Um, and people have visited it like throughout history. There are some super old buildings and roads still there. And, um, there's evidence of a building from as early as the fourth century. Well, which is so cool. Is um, it currently and, inhabited by no, human No, but it's animals? like a it's like a it's, it's a um tourist destination. So you can like take gotcha. a little take gotcha. a little dinghy and sail out there Oof. and like see. And there's like a little plaque by some of like the buildings and stuff like you can like read about old stuff. So mm, is it Snake I love the Island? Kingdom of Snakes. <laughs> right, right. Is it Snake Island? Yes, but like also there's cool stuff there. And well, snakes are cool. You can, you can go for the snakes. <laughs> let, me, let me clarify. But it's not like, I, I mean, we didn't we do a fact once about yeah, like the bad snake island? <laughs> there's a place called Snake Island uh, that is a bad snake island. Yeah. Okay. There are like laws against going there because it's, it's sort of like um, when there's like a place that's so dangerous to uh, climb or go cave diving that they're like, don't make us have to save you from here. That's mm-hmm. what Snake Island mm-hmm. is like, but just with snakes. <laughs> right, right. So this is Calling not it that bad intense. Snake Island, though, may have the yeah. inverse <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> impact. <laughs> <It's> just... <laughs> yes, big time. 
Um, so yeah, anyway, these scientists go to this little island called Golemgrad. Uh, and what do they do? They just start lunging at snakes, just going for it. Uh, and then they grab them as well. Lunge and grab. Uh, and they grab them right around the middle, like right where a bird would maybe go for them. Uh, and one of the researchers is quoted as saying, we acted like a predator that's hesitant to eat the prey and then recorded to see what they do. So they did this to 263 different snakes, which is, oh, that's a lot of snakes. That's a lot yeah, of lunging. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then also after they would get them, after they would catch them, they would like gently squeeze and stretch them a little bit, like maybe as if a predator might do to be like, do I want to eat this? Um, <laughs> and important note, they were very, very careful to not hurt the snakes. That's um, good. They're very gentle, and they did release them when they were done. So no snakes were harmed in the making of this study. Um, but basically, yeah, they made notes. They would like catalog of which snakes did what thing. Like, did they only play dead? Did they also do the poop, muck, poop musk cocktail? Did they also cough up blood? Um, and so, yeah, just under half of the snakes played dead and did the cocktail. Uh, and then 10, oh, 10% took it all the way and coughed up blood. Um, and then they also noted how long the snakes performances were, like how long were they playing dead? Oh, good question. Um, and another fun note about this, which is really what, like the, the methods of this is, are just so funny to me. Um, so they, they found that some snakes were really tense when they were playing dead, like really, really stiff. Um, so they couldn't really move him around, but then other snakes were so limp that, um, some of the grad students would like arrange them into hearts, like on the ground, (laughs) which I think is so (laughs) cute. (laughs) And so, yeah, I just think this study is really, really cute. You know, researchers and their students lunging at snakes, having a lovely time on this Lord of the Rings island, (laughs) turning them into hearts, letting them run free. It's just, this is the spice of life. Um, (laughs) But, Do you know how long some of these performances lasted? Oh, yeah. I think around like 40 seconds. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So almost a minute long, which is wow. considerable, I would say. That is. That is. Yeah. yeah. Um, and OK, so the results. What did they find? So <laughs> snakes that bled from the mouth <laughs> and doused themselves in the musk and poop cocktail, they tended to play dead for two seconds less than other snakes. So what does that right, mean? Because the yeah. production value is higher. They, yeah. they so don't, true. Yeah, they've yeah, already yeah. sold it. That's yeah. so <laughs> true. <laughs> um, so and the scientists think that this means that they um Literally, I mean, what Rachel is saying is probably more effective. Like, they're able to escape a little more quickly, um, is what they think. And so, yeah, more intense performance packs a bigger punch, and it's over quicker. Also, the energy expenditure, I'm, yeah. I'm I imagine. Well, yeah, so that's fascinating what... that they can conjure these secretions. I think so, too. And a lot of, like, the researchers say this, too. It's like a very high-risk, high-reward strategy. Like, mm-hmm. it's a lot easier mm-hmm. to just run away. Um than it is to expend a lot of energy and also risk staying out in the open, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not like I'm running away and hiding. It's no, it's like, no, look at me and how gross I am. (laughs) And potentially get like prodded and fondled for like a few moments more, get shaped into a heart, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I want to know what other things they did. Uh, the I, heart I know, made it into the article, but like, I what else were they too. drawing? How These immature were, students, were they? Right? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so researchers are also like telling people to take this research with a grain of salt because they want to do more research because this is a really you know, limited sample size. It's all about the data. The data set is like these island snakes who've only been hunted by birds and by grad students. <laughs> so Oof. they need to like observe more, you know, things in the real world, in the wild, uh, maybe stuff not involving grad students, uh, grabbing them. Um, and maybe some other, look at some other snake species too, to kind of just get the bigger picture of all of this. Cause now that we know, like there are multiple snakes that play dead in a very dramatic way. Like what does this mean for just snakes as a whole and their behavior and also like other reptiles and other animals. I don't know. It's like a a kind of a cool question. Um, And I hope they do more research because I really want to know like the mechanics of how they cough up the blood. Where does the blood come from? Yeah, totally. You know, like what's the deal there? Um, But Who's but yeah, their that's special effects master. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what is this blood? I need to know. Um, 
So that's my snake fact. Uh, I think they're wonderfully like cute little actors and it works for them. It re- yes. it works. They they live. Um, not all of them, but most of them will live when they play dead, which I think is very special. You got to die to live, you know? <laughs> you got to die to live. Yeah. Also, uh, this is like a great advice for thwarting unwanted attention. You know, you yes. can run away <laughs> Just, or you could be like, look at how gross I am. Yeah, it makes me think of, um, I, I don't know who said this first, but I always hear people talk about like, if a man is harassing you on the subway, just look at him and yell and look, be the weirdest person you can be. And that yeah, will deter yeah, them. Yeah. And if that doesn't work, take it up a notch, puke blood. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. I, I just start carrying like those little, uh, little pills little you can capsules. crunch. Little yeah. capsule. Yeah. It's like fake blood. Be like, <coughs> oh, yeah, no. yeah, 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 yeah. The thing that that's... men hate the most on the subway is a tubercular gal, you know? <laughs> In my humble experience. Not in fashion anymore. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, I love these I love these little snakes. They're the, the theater kids of the animal world. Mm-hmm. Um, amazing. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and then we'll be back with some more facts. Support for today's episode comes from Honey Love. And boy, does Honey Love offer plenty of support. With Honey Love, you can say goodbye to underwire forever without sacrificing any of the lift you're looking for. For a limited time only, you can get Honey Love on sale. Get 20% off your entire order with our exclusive link, honeylove.com slash weirdest. Support our show and check them out at honeylove.com forward slash weirdest. You know that feeling when you get home after a long day, especially in the summer heat, and you can finally take off your bra? Well, unfortunately, you'll never be experiencing that feeling again. Honey Love's best-selling crossover bra gives all of the support of a traditional bra without any uncomfortable underwires. If you're looking for a more relaxed lounge bra, I definitely recommend trying out Honey Love's V-Bra. It's designed to lift and separate, so you won't get the dreaded uniboob, but again, still super comfy. I always grab my Honey Love bras when I'm lounging around the house and just looking to be as comfortable as possible. I'm not going to say I never wear underwear bras anymore. I'm wearing one right now, actually, but I kind of wish I had gone with a Honey Love bra instead. But it doesn't stop with bras. Honey Love has incredibly comfortable shapewear, tanks, and leggings. Whether you're working out, headed to a summer wedding, or taking a much-deserved nap, Honey Love has you covered. Honey Love is not just supporting women, it's empowering women. Treat yourself to the best bras on the market and save 20% off at honeylove.com weirdest. Use our exclusive link to get 20% off honeylove.com slash weirdest to find your perfect fit. After you purchase, they ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. Honeys, you deserve this. Free the pain and discomfort. Keep the support with Honey Love. You know that feeling when you're running late and you just can't find all the stuff you need to put in your bag to get out the door to live your life? Yeah, it happens to me all the time. In fact, this morning I spent like 10 minutes running around looking for my phone. Now we can all save ourselves the anxiety and trouble and time by stocking up on tile trackers. You just need to attach a tile to like your keys or your phone or put one in your wallet and then you just ask the app to ring your tile and if it's really lost it can track down its location. In fact unlike other trackers tiles can help track down stolen items without tipping off whoever took your stuff. I'm really looking forward to getting a tile to keep on my keys because listen of keys are hard to keep track of. When you add Tile to the Life360 app, you can see everyone and everything all in one place. You can even put a tile on your pet's collar so you can keep tabs on where members of your family are. You can all stay in touch about your ETAs and make sure your furry friends are where they're supposed to be too. You can even get a lost and found QR code with your contact info so that if a good Samaritan finds your lost item, they can scan it and get in touch with you. Keep track of what's important with Tile. Visit Tile.com today and use code WEIRDEST to get 15% off all tiles. That's Tile.com, code WEIRDEST. Okay, we're back. And um, Owen, tell me about some jousting. Ooh, some ritualistic jousting? Yes. Um, (laughs) In high school, I definitely did some fencing. (laughs) (laughs) But I'll say, uh, despite being an adolescent, it never got as horny as what we're going to describe. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm going to start with a quote from Canadian biologist Anne Innes Dagg. She says, quote, 
Necking involved one male gently rubbing his head or neck against the body of another, or the two males mutually rubbing their trunks and necks together. This often sexually aroused one so that he mounted the other or even several other males. There seemed to be no jealousy among partners. Dot, dot, dot. Do y'all know what animal I'm talking about? Well, I heard trunk. Yeah. Is it <laughs> elephant? And neck. <laughs> It's true. I don't think of el- I don't think of elephants as, as having as much having of a, a neck. neck. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I feel true. like I'm a medieval scholar <laughs> describing some animal that I'm seeing. <laughs> yeah. um, is it is it a giraffe? It is a giraffe. It is mm. yes. So I wanted to talk about the giraffe necking behavior, which is exclusive to the males of the species. Uh, in part because Anne Innes Dagg was a pioneering zoologist and biologist from Canada who recently passed. She passed in April of last month. And mm. I knew about her investigations into their same sex sexual behavior, but felt like this was a timely opportunity to look a little bit further into this and to really understand what she was up against within the field of behavioral biology as being a woman who was pretty adamant at calling this sexual behavior. So yeah, so we are talking about giraffes and their necking behavior. So much is made of uh, giraffe necks. So what is necking? Let's see a good description. Necking involves caressing the body with the neck Mm -hmm. among one or more giraffes. Interestingly enough, giraffes often have a preferred side like they're left-handed right-handed when they meet up one will always be like i can i this is my good side let me be over (laughs) here and then they'll begin to tenderly rub each other and then that will uh, amplify in you know presumed aggression though there is never any intent to injure and in fact injury is rarely ever the result of this which we can talk about a little bit more And so they'll caress each other, wrapping their long necks around each other, exploring each other's bodies, sniffing and licking, often of the genitals. And uh, some males will actually perform, oh, what is it called? I want to say Fremen, but that's from Dune. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I have the word written down uh, somewhere here. So when so some males will flare their lips as they would if they were in a courtship behavior with a mm. female as she was urinating in order to suck right. in the pheromones. So they'll do this with each other as well and like, you know, explore each other. <clears throat> other males tend to get curious, begin to observe, and then at some point uh, will be invited to engage, which is really exciting. Uh, this often results in erection. And in a stag talks about the penis being eight inches long and looking rather like a crochet hook. And it's very... <laughs> <laughs> My God. <laughs> right. <laughs> and and uh, she describes that she often sees liquid dripping from the tip. What an image. What an image indeed. Many of these males will mount each other. Anal p- penetration does occur. And full orgasm and ejaculation. So, pretty gay, right? <laughs> Super gay. Yeah, I yeah. would say so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there seems to be this sort of, like, recurring question within the scientific community. Like, fellas, is it gay to <laughs> to sniff your mate, mount them, ejaculate? <laughs> like, couldn't possibly be. <laughs> And one thing that I think is really profound about Anne in Stag is that she boldly did declare this as being the result of the reward of pleasure and mm-hmm. the pursuit of sex because it is specifically among males. Studies have shown that the frequency of same-sex behavior among males in giraffes is far higher than heterosexual or reprocentric sex. A lot of that has to do with the fact that gestation with female giraffes takes a long time. It's like 15 months, then there's a recovery period of 20 months at minimum in between. So rarely do any adult males actually perform heterosexual reprocentric sex with a female. And for the most part, they're having just 
heroic amounts of male sex, male male <laughs> right. action going on because they want to. They're horny and it's pleasurable. Yeah. We often don't afford pleasure to animals, but like clearly this is something that's happening. The presence of erection, the presence of the f- lip splaying, all indicative of the fact that this is about courtship, about mating, about m- mounting. Um, <clears throat> though many scientists, there's like an evergreen argument or reasoning behind same-sex sexual behavior, that it is purely a social function, which I do believe that it is. When is sex not part of a social context, part of a historical context, part of a social political context about, you know, two people, two animals, human animals, giraffe animals, getting to know each other, establishing some sort of relationship. But I think there's an overemphasis on dominance as being Mm. the primary outcome. Many people talk about necking, and it has been described as ritualistic jousting, which is exciting, but it does sort of fail to cross the line into actual aggro behavior because of the lack of injury and the result of sex and orgasm instead. So I think, you know, domination is part of it. And within giraffes, it's interesting There's like necking in giraffes offers an interesting rebuttal to the sort of desexualized, neutered explanation that this is all about dominance because they do actually have a hierarchical structure. They have like a social system that is about dominance. But when it comes to the male male sexual behavior, all that goes out the window. Pleasure Mm. is for everybody. It's like very homo-communist. And so that sort of, they're not doing it in order to establish a social hierarchy. They're in fact ignoring social hierarchy and will mount one and then go over and mount another. Many males, up to six at a time, will be involved in this. Right? Right? Think about all of those necks. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. a lot of like necks. Writhing <laughs> a lot of necks. A lot of necks. It's also described as a stately dance. Which is really wow. exciting. I know. Any choreographers out there want to like uh, reenact this? Yeah. Like, hit me up. <laughs> the stately dance of it, which speaks to its virtuosity, which is another interesting point. This is something that they perform, and they perform for themselves and for each other. And there is like a, a trained amount of gentlemanly uh, um, force that doesn't go beyond. The cause of pain. So there is, you know, there's a little BDSM involved, but it's like clearly not accidental. Sure. Another yeah. one of the common explanations given to same sex sexual behavior in the animal kingdom is that it's simply the result of confusion. But there's just like a lot of whoopsie going on among animals, which this seems to refute because they mm-hmm. have yeah. to be good at this. You don't like yeah. accidentally you know, become a power bottom because you like made a mistake. <laughs> like they're <laughs> they're like taking six giraffes and doing yeah. it with high frequency. Mm-hmm. There yeah. was a study in Tanzania uh, that looked at mountings, just mountings in general, <clears throat> among giraffes in the wild over 3,200 hours. They observed 18 sexual mountings. How many of those mountings would you suppose were same sex? All? Ooh. All but one. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love that vote that of optimism. <laughs> All yeah. but one. It's like 94%. And this has been a frequency that seems to continue to show up among observations. Of course, a lot of the observations when scientists look at this behavior, they're so quick to misinterpret or misidentify it as simply a social function, disregarding the sexual aspect of it. And so the data doesn't actually go into sexual data. It's like, oh, this is about male-male aggression. And so we're not going to really look at that. And we'll only observe the reprocentric mountings that we see. But when you are open to looking at as a sexual activity, you realize, oh, yeah, there's an abundance of it. And that's something that Anne did. And I really want to give her a shout out and just like thank her and honor her. She's so fascinating. She was born in Toronto and uh, just studied biology, was up against a lot of misogyny, which she spoke out about and has written about. And in 
1956, she self-funded a trip to South Africa to study on her own as a 23-year-old giraffes in the wild. Dude, what? What a legend. Absolutely iconic queen. (laughs) She wrote to two different like giraffe uh, research facilities, uh, used an alias. She shortened her first name. She abbreviated it to A, so it was just A. Innes. And they both accepted her. And with one of them, when she showed up and they saw she was indeed a woman, they denied her entry. But she was dogged in the pursuit of giraffe knowledge, studying their their ecosystems, their behavior, all of these things, following them around in her little car. Also, she was, you know, this is height of apartheid in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So she was studying them with all different types of people, not just the white Western scientists, but also people indigenous to South Africa. Um, So breaking a lot of grounds and barriers and then went back and was the first person to to publish studies of giraffe behavior in the wild and really has been an advocate for their abundant queerness up until last month. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What an iconic lady. Absolutely. Absolutely. You should watch. There are so many videos of her. There's actually a documentary. Oh, is there? Yeah, there is. I don't remember the name of it but well we can find it yeah we'll find it it. we'll find it and link it yeah she's she's really beautiful um and also to bring it back to my personal sacred text biological exuberance written by bruce bagamel uh from seattle uh phd he has a whole section about giraffes and there's a really wonderful quote in it let's see he says When a male giraffe sniffs a female's rear end without any mounting, erection, penetration, or ejaculation, he is described as being sexually interested in her, and his behavior is classified as primarily, if not exclusively, sexual. We see that play out among many scientific observations. Yet, quote, When a male giraffe sniffs another male's genitals, mounts him with an erect penis, and ejaculates, He is engaging in aggressive or dominance behavior, and his actions are considered to be, at most, only secondarily or superficially sexual. So Mm. one thing that he also confronted was the amount of homophobic closeting that has happened. It's a historic and ongoing practice within many scientific institutions and practices. Because as I'm sure, you know, we all know... The practice of science reflects the practices <laughs> of the scientists Big time. And, and the way that they observe behavior from their own biases and cultural biases. And so there has over time been a large pushback to, sh- to declaring animals as gay. Uh, are you familiar with Valerius Geist, the sheep mammologist? <laughs> um, not off the top of my head, no, oh, please okay. tell me more. <laughs> so he, in the 19th century, uh, forgive me for not knowing exact dates, but he was the go-to uh, mammologist on bighorn sheep, another hooved animal that lives most of the year in exclusively sex-segregated herds. So mm-hmm. male-male herds, female-female herds, and in that time, they're having a lot of same-sex sexual behavior. It's very easy to observe. It's high frequency. He loved these sheep so much that he (laughs) refused to publish this data for fear that that humans would perceive them as queers. He later reflected on this being like, I am not afraid of the amount of like anthropomorphizing that would go into calling this sexual behavior or homosexual behavior, but I don't want there to be the uh, assumption of stigma and shame that yeah. we give to human animals, which right. is, uh, that's where I feel like it gets messy. And mm-hmm. I, I do want to like draw the line. I'm like, let's not give, let's not project shame and stigma on animals. Sure. Yeah. Let's just say what it is. Totally. Uh, yeah. Also wondering question for you all. I was yeah. listening to this podcast and I was like, oh, there's a culture of asking questions, which I really love. Please. <laughs> so do you all know what the collective noun of giraffes are? Ooh, I feel like I got this on like a Snapple cap once, but yeah. I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I definitely don't know. <laughs> well, the boring answer is a herd because they're hooked oh, okay. animals because okay. they're ungulates. But the exciting answer is that it's a tower. Oh. <gasps> 
oh. a tower of giraffes. I love that. Right? That's really nice. Like put that on a tarot card. Yeah, beautiful. All right, we're going to take one more quick break and then we'll be back with one more fact. This episode is proudly brought to you by the award-winning hair care line, Lola V. Remember the Rachel? Not the Rachel that hosts The Weirdest Thing I Learned this week. I'm talking about the Rachel, the haircut that ruled supreme while Jennifer Aniston was on the show Friends. As a child, I received this haircut several times, presumably through some subconscious association hairdressers had between me and Rachel on Friends, because as someone with, like, a giant frizzy mane of curls, let me tell you what, that cut was not for me. Eventually, even Jen moved on, from the 90s flat iron craze, which is lucky for us because her obsession with finding naturally derived effective hair care products led her to create today's sponsor, Lolivy. And here's a treat for you, our awesome listeners. For a limited time, you get an exclusive 15% off your entire order at lolavie.com. Just use code WEIRDEST at checkout. I've been trying out the whole Lolavi line this week and I really enjoy it. My favorite is probably the glossing detangler. It makes it so easy to brush through my wild curls with minimal tangling and breakage. I'm also in love with the Lola V detangling brush. I think it's probably the best one I've tried. All of Lola V's products feature their signature scent, which is a naturally derived blend of herbal, citrus, and woody notes. It's like you're in the woods while someone is rubbing lotion on your hands or something. It's great. Unlock Jennifer Aniston approved hair at lolavie.com. As our loyal listeners, you'll get an exclusive 15% off your entire order when you use code WEIRDEST at checkout. That's 15% off your order at lolavie.com with promo code WEIRDEST. Please note you can only use one product promo code per order and discounts can't be combined. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. Your hair will thank you. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. This year is going by so quickly, which has me really stopping to take stock of what I've accomplished so far in 2024. When life moves fast, it's important to take a moment to celebrate your wins and recalibrate to make sure you're making the most of the rest of the year. Therapy can help you take stock of your progress and set achievable goals for the next six months. I have a great therapist I've been seeing for several years. And actually, just at my last session, we we're talking about what I've done this year and what I'm hoping to do and, you know, what goals are healthy for me and what motivations might be grounded in trauma and anxiety. Whatever your lived experience or circumstances are, there's a good chance that therapy can help you become the best version of yourself. If you're thinking of engaging with a therapist, but you don't know where to start, you might consider giving BetterHelp a try. It's all entirely online, so it's designed to be really convenient and flexible. It's suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire and you'll get matched with a licensed therapist. If they're not a good fit, you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Take a moment. Visit BetterHelp.com weirdest today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash weirdest. Weirdest. Fast forward to the end of 2024. Think of your goals. What can you do right now to give yourself the best chance of succeeding? If one of those goals is to learn a new language, you should absolutely get Babbel to help you out. With Babbel, you don't have to pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by more than 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. I've been using Babbel to try to brush up on my German skills, and while I'm definitely not great about using it every day, because if I did, I would speak German way better than I do now, it's super convenient courses make it easy for me to jump in and freshen up my vocab skills and learn a little new grammar whenever I have a few minutes to spare. But you don't have to take my word for it. Babbel has sold more than 16 million subscriptions. Plus, all of Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by their 20-day money-back guarantee, so you've got nothing to lose. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners at babbel.com weirdest. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com weirdest. Spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash weirdest. Rules and restrictions may apply. Okay, we're back, and um, I'm going to get into my fact, which is about a bird called uh, Paris Minor, or a Japanese tit, which makes Googling this research perilous. Snickers, uh, snicker, snicker. <laughs> yeah. So I, 
I recommend uh, adding keywords like birds uh, or even their Latin name if you if you wish to seek out more information on the story I am about to tell um, or not. And just like know that you're going to get some other stuff and maybe that's what you want and that's OK. Um, so be open to the possibility. Yeah, exactly. Just, just be aware. <laughs> Proceed with knowledge. Um, so uh, scientists from the University of Tokyo um were observing these birds that they'd previously found to communicate pretty sophisticatedly. Um, in a 2018 study, and then actually another study in 2016, uh, they argued that the call combinations used by the birds amounted to compositional syntax, uh, which only humans are, are known for sure to use. And that's our ability to put words and phrases together in a way that creates new meanings. Um, we know that many non-human animals use uh, what's called referential communication. So like sounds mean specific things, but syntax makes speech more complicated, but also makes it more useful. It can encode more information. Uh, you have phonological and compositional syntax. Phonological syntax are like sounds that individually they don't have any meaning come together and now they have meaning. And uh, previously, non-human animals were only supposed to have phonological syntax. These birds, uh, researchers had said, no, they actually have uh, compositional syntax. The example is that um, when they were signaling to other birds about a predator, uh, they would be scanning for predators. They would make this ABC call. So putting together, you know, these clusters of sounds, A, B, and C, um, and that was a signal that birds should be scanning for predators. And then when they followed it up with D, that meant birds should approach each other. Uh, so ABCD was like, look around for predators, but come over here. Um, and they were like, well, maybe they're just hearing those two separate like words, if you will, A, B, C, and D, and doing two reactions because they are hearing both uh, pieces of information. But then they like scrambled it up. They played like D, A, B, C, and the birds were like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> mm. um, so it basically, they were saying they're putting together like sentences, if mm -hmm. you will. Um, that is not, you know, that was like just a couple of studies from one research group. It's still sort of an ongoing question. Uh, if we can call that compositional syntax and whether other birds do it. But uh, the same group, which is uh, led by a researcher who has now been observing uh, these birds for 17 years, uh, was like, what other kinds of communication might these birds be doing? Let's look at gesture. <laughs> and gesture is really interesting um, because some kinds of gestures are like quite common in non-human animals and some are really, really rare. Uh, we have um, humans have I, I looked up different kinds of gestures uh, for this and I'm kind of delighted. So I'm just going to share, even though it's not the most important to the study. Um, so we have what are called motor or beat gestures. And those are things that can only occur in tandem with speech. It's stuff like gesticulating to emphasize a point. Um, and then we have lexical or iconic gestures. Uh, those also happen with speech, but they either echo or elaborate on the meaning of the words being spoken. So like rubbing your hands together when you say that you're cold or like using air quotes. Um, and yeah, like uh, just uh, it's it's emphasizing or, or changing the meaning of the words mm -hmm. you're saying, but it's with words. They don't really mean something mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. We've all own. been rubbing our chins this whole yes. time. To, yeah, exactly. To yeah. indicate the scholarly nature of the yeah. discussion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true this entire time. Um, then there are diactic or indexical gestures. Indexical, what a word. Um, and those can happen either with or without vocalized speech. Um, so those are indicative. So like a point or like a ta-da motion where it's like, look at this <laughs> or look at that. Um, so limited meaning, but extremely useful. And it's generally thought that um, indexical gestures are the only kind of gestures that non-primates can make. There's been some research on uh, 
for example, ravens and certain kinds of fish, um, that they have gestures that mean like, look at that. <laughs> um, again, like not in, not super complex, but like still communication and um, really useful. Uh, and, you know, sort of like using your your body as a tool, um, if you think about it. And uh, then dogs and elephants have both been shown to understand what humans mean when they point at something, um, even if they don't point themselves. So, uh, you know, it does seem like this sort of straightforward um, indexical gesture is like a lot of animals probably have the cognition to figure out what that means or do it. Um, but symbolic gestures are another matter entirely. These are gestures that are like inherently loaded with meaning. So like a wave, an eye roll, a clap, a come hither motion. Um, chimps use dozens of gestures, many of them symbolic, to communicate with each other. Um, you know, that is how they manage sophisticated communication with, uh, you know, much more limited vocal repertoire than humans have. Um, and research suggests that actually humans can usually figure out what chimp gestures mean, which is fun. Uh, there, there have been some studies where they show humans like a hundred different chimp gestures and hmm. we mostly hmm. can figure out what they mean, wow, which, they can interpret um, that. you know, it's a, it, like sometimes researchers are like, this is, you know, this shows how early back in our evolution the gesturing goes. Uh, it's like it makes intuitive sense to us. Um, and I just think it's fun yeah, to that... think about trying to interpret the message of a chimp. Absolutely. Yeah, just trying uh, to get your attention. <laughs> that, that makes me think that chimps also have a rather robust gestural vocabulary for indicating what kind of sex they want to have. Really? Totally, yeah. Yeah, oh so they have, I mean, they do come hither. They will, like, talk about, like, oh, we just want, like, nuzzling. Mm -hmm. I want, like, genital engagement. Uh, yeah, yeah. So they I'm can so communicate you beforehand, yeah. you know, to each other. <laughs> I love that. Isn't that beautiful? It is. It's lovely. Um, they've figured out how to communicate about <laughs> right, sex. I was going to say. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um... But anyway, back to the Japanese tit. It seems like they might also be capable of <laughs> symbolic gestures. Um, I know, I know. I like as as many times as I'm in, as I encounter the fact that there are birds called tits. It's still yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, 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 it's yeah. just great. I mean, I mean tits are great all around. Full like, stop. True. Thinking about like true. a horny group of people, they're out there yeah. being like, "It's a booby. It's yeah. a yeah. dick sissel." Yeah, it's You're right. like, "Come on, <laughs> yeah." <laughs> they know what they're they doing. As a gay birder, they know. Yeah. I will say, <laughs> yeah, they know what they're doing. So, um, in the forest where these birds live, um, uh, again, these researchers have been observing them for 17 years and counting now. Wow. And in that time, they've installed um, dozens or hundreds of nest boxes that are meant to um, mimic the tree cavities that these birds usually live inside of. Um, and uh, an important thing about them is that only one bird can fit through the entry hole of these cavities and the boxes meant to mimic them at a time. Um, so you, uh, they do not enter simultaneously. Um, so that will become important in a second. So in this new study, uh, the researchers observed a bunch of nest visitations um, because they were investigating something that they thought they had spotted. They were like, we were pretty sure that we're seeing the birds. Sometimes one of them will flap their wings in this very particular way. And that we think they're telling the other bird to go into the nest before them. And so they were like, okay, we're going to observe a lot of birds entering the nest. And they watched more than 320 from eight different mated pairs. They were bringing foods back to the, the little, uh, the little huts to feed their babies. Um, and they did see this behavior happening. And uh, it was most often performed by females, but both of them would do it. And um, regardless of which bird arrived first at the site, uh, if one of them fluttered their wings, the other one would enter the box first. And actually, usually the female would enter 
first. So it kind of made sense that the females were more likely to do this gesture because basically they would be like, buy their little nest box. And in the normal course of events, apparently, mom would go in first. Uh, and if instead she flutters her wings, dad goes in first. Mm, Why? Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, but yeah. that does seem to be what the flutter was indicating. Um, and of course, all of the all of the coverage of this uh, recent study was like they're saying after you, <laughs> right. <laughs> like right? Right, 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 that right. That is very adorable, and also like they could just as easily be saying like, "Hurry the f- up!" Totally. <laughs> 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 but you know, I digress. Uh, they got them. Uh, you know, they make this gesture, and it seems to be saying, "Please enter." Mm -hmm. the box we Mm -hmm. live in uh, before I go in. Mm -hmm. And yeah, there were a few things about the way they used this motion that uh, the researchers say does indicate it. It's being used in this symbolic gesture fashion. Um, So they only made this flutter when they were together in pairs. It wasn't something they saw the birds ever do when they were alone. Mm. Um, They would stop the motion once the mate entered the box uh, they didn't physically touch the other bird. They also didn't gesture toward the box. They so which would have made it more of a mm-hmm. you know this indexical thing. They were fluttering at the other bird. It was hmm. it was they were going like you do something. Yeah. And so yeah, they all of this together uh, combined with the sort of like frequency with which they saw this sequence of events happening makes the researchers say they are pretty confident that this is a symbolic gesture that, that that birds have a wave that means get in the house you yeah. know I, again yeah. tone yeah. who knows but the message is is clear um, i want to think that it's like i'm afraid to go in there it's dark there could be monsters or a bad guy will you please go check first <laughs> i also <laughs> had that thought yeah because i was like these are like fake tree cavities that researchers put yeah. up and maybe right, sometimes right. they're like I don't know maybe there's a grad student doing something weird in there <laughs> yeah. <laughs> gonna grab me yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah I was thinking maybe she's just like I need a moment yeah I right need, I need a moment totally go yeah there. also go sometimes tidy go yeah. tidy exactly up. yeah yeah um all all really valid reasons right, right um yeah so what's really cool about this is uh like I said it's uh they're probably not the first people to claim they have seen symbolic dusters and other animals. I'm sure there have been other studies doing that, but uh, you know, it's not something that's been really conclusively proven in another animal. So if they're able to keep observing these birds and you know this is reproduced, that would be very exciting. And then you know, of course, uh, you know, if one non primate is doing this, then it's like I bet there are a bunch that we don't know about and haven't thought about. And I think it's, you know, what's always really exciting about this kind of animal behavior research is that um, there are so many animals that, like, physiologically do not have the same gestural tools we have. (laughs) So it's sort of like how many animals are there that do communicate to each other with symbolic gestures? And it's just that, like, what they're doing involves, you know features or body parts that we don't pay attention Mm -hmm. to as being important for communication. Um, I mean, we often fail to recognize the symbolic gestures of each other just across culture. Very true. So, you know, trans species. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. When I was looking at the, like, list of gestures, there was definitely a lot of them that are, like, so rude in one country, you know, very chill in another, which, Mm -hmm. you know, is, of course, a a classic uh, trope. Um, but yeah, the other thing that uh, the researchers really like about this is because um, humans are thought to have relied on gestures quite a bit in developing our communication. You know, of course, because chimps use symbolic gestures to have very sophisticated communication with each other, even though they don't have uh, speech at all like ours. Um, the thought is that speech you know, came out of an existing communication system that we had that, Mm -hmm. you know, probably did rely heavily on gestures. So just in terms of studying the evolution of like social cognition, um, it's it's really exciting. There's a school of thought that basically once humans started walking on two legs, uh, 
our hands were free. <laughs> so mm-hmm. we were able to oh, do way more complicated stuff with our communication. That's interesting. And yeah, and that things just kind of unfolded from there. Um, and the researchers were like, birds also have their hands yeah, free. That's if true. you think about it, they mm-hmm. can perch. And uh, <laughs> oh, and while we were taking a break, you mentioned uh, that meme of the bird pointing angrily with their wings. <laughs> yes. Um, I would say that that is probably indexical. But I don't know. Could be symbolic. Could be exasperation. Mm-hmm. Hard to say. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> anyway. Is not pointing at, is not looking at the thing that they're That's pointing true. at, is making direct eye contact. Yeah. So it's sort of <laughs> like, get your ass in there. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, incredible. Um, I love that we had all animal stories today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, me too. A yes. delightful... Uh, assortment of um, tales about about cute little critters and mm-hmm. and f- funky little guys. Um, <laughs> always enjoyable. Uh, Owen, thank you so much for coming on. This was great. This was such a pleasure. It was so such fun. Such a pleasure. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> as a curious person as you all are, I am so excited to now know about these snakes and these birds. The Japanese tit <laughs> deserves yeah. being said one more time. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely uh, um, and remind listeners uh, what your show is called so that they can find it yeah so I'm Owen Ever co-host of a field guide to gay animals from Canada land it will be streaming on Apple Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts coming this June Woo! pride month Woo! the weirdest thing I learned this week is produced by all of our hosts including me Rachel Faltman along with Jess Bodie, who also serves as our audio engineer and editor extraordinaire. Our theme music is by Billy Cadden. Our logo is by Katie Belloff. If you have questions, suggestions, or weird stories to share, tweet us at weirdest underscore thing. Thanks for listening, weirdos.